Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure to welcome Bo An to Microsoft Research today. Um, Bo An is an assistant professor at um, Nangang Technological University from Singapore. And his researching interests include artificial intelligence, multi-agent systems, optimization, and game theory. He has been doing very cool work on the intersection of um, sustainability and game theory, and he's going to be talking about that today. Thank you, Ed. So um, morning. Thanks for coming, and it's my honor to be here. Uh, so um, today I'm going to talk about some two pieces of work on kind of applying game theory to computational sustainability. Um, and this is joint work with my uh, students um, from China and Singapore. And it's been published in uh, each 13 each 15 and AMAS 15 this year. Um, so, let me start with a brief introduction about the research work I'm doing. So um, I basically focus on research on game theory for security. And um, most of my work is about on game theory for security, uh, basically how to apply game theory uh, as a framework to model the, uh, the game between terrorists and the security agency. We try to come up efficient allocation of security resources to protect key infrastructure, such as airports, ports, uh, flights, those type of things. And recently, we just extended this framework to, for, um, like to protect forest, protect wildlife, uh, those type of new domains. Um, so that's number one. The other one I was working on is about bargaining and its applications to, uh, uh, I guess, which one? Oh, sorry. Um, application to um, some real-world applications on, uh, for education, allocating resources as well. So um, today I'm going to talk about another branch of work I'm doing, which is about uh, computational sustainability. Um, this line work is more applied work. And um, today I'm going to explain two lines of work. Sounds like this one is not working. Um, two problems which are kind of related. And the first one is about optimizing efficiency of taxi systems. Um, and the second one is about uh, some recent work on electric vehicle charging station placement. Um, so I'm going to start from the first one. Um, so this is a real world problem I observed after I, when I was working in Beijing. So after I finished my postdoc in USC, uh, Southern California in uh, Los Angeles, in 2012, I spent one year in Beijing to work in Chinese Academy of Science. Then I, 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 um, I'm living in Beijing. Now, one problem I found is it's super difficult to take a taxi, especially during rush hour. Uh, I waited like two hours to wait for a taxi, but I still could not get a taxi. Um, I, I saw taxis driving by, empty, but they will not stop. They just do not want to take you. Um, lots of people observed that. Um, so I guess, as you all know, taxi system is extremely important. It's huge, and it's fully decentralized, because each taxi driver is somehow they're kind of self-interested because they, they are driven by their revenue. They want to earn more money. Um, normally, the tax system, system is efficient and hard to manage and optimize. So that's, that's what we're talking about. So um, this is what's happening in Beijing. Uh, as I mentioned, I just could not find, ta find tanks during rush hour. Then lots of people ob observe this issue. Then people start to think about whether it's because Beijing, we just do not have enough taxis. But the government said, no, we have enough taxis. But what's happening is, during the rush hour, um, so we see something like this. This is like one day. Um, during the rush hour, we see lots of customers are waiting for taxis. 
a non-queue like this. But at the, at the same time, lots of taxis are parking in a big parking lot or just parking around the street. They just do not want to work. So then after that, every time when I took taxi, I start to talk to the taxi driver, what's happening? Then they tell me, in Beijing, the, the, taxi, the fare is basically de, uh, determined by the distance. But we all know that the traffic congestion is extremely, the traffic is extremely heavy in Beijing during rush hour. But the, the fare is always the same during the day, which means during rush hour, they cannot move fast, they cannot earn money. Um, but during rush hour, even they are driving slowly, but the gas cost is even higher. You have this experience when you're stop and drive, stop, drive, the gas cost is much higher. So if they work during rush hour, they will lose money. Uh, so that's a phenomenon. Then we start to think about perhaps we can somehow solve this problem just using this simple idea, just increase the fair price during rush hour. This is extremely simple, and it has been used in many other countries like Singapore. Um, the, the, the country I'm living now. So in Singapore, from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., the, the fare is increased by another, uh, I think, 25%. Basically, tax drivers can earn more when they work during rush hour. So, but the problem is how much should be the optimal price? That's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, now, so basically, we, we, we need to, to solve the problem. We need to model this taxi market. We need to model the taxi drivers, their revenue, as well as you know, um, how, how you know, we want to more optimize the efficiency, how the efficiency is uh, affected by the fair price. This is super complex, complex taxi systems. Because there are many factors with complex interdependencies, like customer demand, congestion level, travel speed, uh, customer waiting time. For instance, if the, the fare is too high, obviously not customers will not take taxi because it's too expensive. Uh, also, if the congestion is too, too um, the congestion level also is determined by the number of taxis, taxis on the road, right? More taxis, then the congestion would be even worse. And also travel speed also affected by um, uh, many other factors. So com very compl complex system. And this changes over time because the normal demand will change over time. So rush hour, the demand is higher. Uh, normal demand is higher. And another thing is, as we just mentioned, taxi drivers are super strategic. Yes? Is there a taxi dispatch system, or do you just have a flat car? So what do you mean? Like you have a central dispatch system for No, 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 no. It's fully disputed. Like in Beijing. So you cannot call a number to get a taxi, you just have to wait on the side of the road? Well, that's something we have not considered um, in this paper. Oh. That's something that's really new. I guess that would be something interesting to look at the new technology like Uber or other things, how that will affect the efficiency of taxi systems. But for here, we just assume taxis are just driving on a road. If you see a taxi, just ask them to stop and take the taxi. But that would be something interesting to extend this model. Just because you've blown up Uber, <laughs> um, do you know what kind of a pricing model Uber applies? Uber? Yeah. I do not know, to be honest. Um, I guess that would be some, something interesting. I heard some people did some work on that, uh, but it's not published to, to look at how Uber you know, would affect the efficiency of a taxi system. Sounds like this result is quite negative, but it's not published. But I, I guess it's quite interesting to explore. Um, there's, a, there's a qualitative paper this year at CHI mm -hmm. by uh, ACI and people like they interviewed some taxi drivers of how they perceive the search pricing and how they actually work. So they gave some assumptions for that. Mm -hmm. And also, they also have time as the price factor. So. Okay. So let me just continue. Taxi driver, we assume they're strategic. 
They just want to optimize their objective to earn more money. But obviously, they also have some constraints. Um, as I just mentioned, self-control, profit driven, and they also have some scheduling constraints. For instance, they cannot work for 24 hours per day. They have to take breaks. Uh, I guess that's why in Beijing, lots of taxi drivers, they choose to take breaks during rush hour, because they have to have dinner, for instance. Uh, that's the right time for them to do that. So, um, well, for modeling this market, there has been a lot of work in the transportation science literature for modeling how different factors affect each other. What, what would be the dependency, those types of things. We just borrow the ideas from the, that literature to build the, the system model. Then we need to deal with the strategic tank driver and, and solve this problem. Um, so this is like some equation, how, to, how we model different factors. You just fully ignore the details. But uh, all the equations are from transportation science literature, how different factors will affect each other, how the number of drivers, how, how the travel speed is determined, how the, you know, how the waiting time is decided based on the number of normal traffic, normal cars, the number of normal cars, and number of um, taxis, and revenue, everything. So we have those types of things. Um, positive idea from transportation science. And this is pretty much the system model where basically we show how the different factors affect each other. Um, so we have this fair, fair price F. Um, then we have the number of served sort of customer system efficiency, waiting time, travel speed, load condition, uh, those type of things. Um, I will not talk about details, but uh, they are all interdependent. Um, I guess basically the problem itself it's like a binevel optimization problem. So what we want to help is to help the government to decide the optimal fair price to maximize the efficiency of the taxi system. Uh, what do, do we mean by efficiency? It is the number of served customers. Uh, we want to maximize that number. Now, after we decide the fair, after the government decides the fair price, like rush hour, how much you will charge per kilometer, um, then the taxi drivers they will play the game to decide what is their optimal schedule, their strategy. Their strategy will definitely affect the system efficiency. So this, that's why this is like a bi-level optimization problem. And higher level, the government decides the price, and at low level, taxi players, uh, th taxi drivers, play the game, and they just they're like compute equilibrium and execute the equilibrium strategy. And the equilibrium strategy basically de depends on the, the the variable in the higher level, the the tax market, the fair price, and which will affect the um, system efficiency. Uh, is this clear? Why is the system, the criteria, efficiency criteria, the number of served customers? Is there always more customers than they can be served? Or? Well, I guess uh, number one is that is just the one we use in, the, in our current model. But obviously, this can be extended to many other things uh, to combine different things. Um, this is reasonable because in the beginning, if you, if you want to minimize the number of unserved customers, then that's easy. You just set the price to be infinite, extremely high, because nobody wants to take a taxi. The number of unserved customers is zero, which is minimized. So that's why we want to somehow maximize the number of served customers. Um, so at each time point, given you know, the... Um, the current situation, the fair price, the, the congestion level, we can compute how many people want to take taxi. That is a demand. And with a demand, only some number can be served by the system. That's something we want to maximize. Yes? You put another kind of metric as well? What do you mean by super? Like the number of customers that were served per unit of time. Oh, OK. Uh, we all? 
I guess yes, this is uh, equivalent because we just treat the number of served customer during each hour. Yeah, so it's kind of equivalent. Yeah. Okay. So, so we consider the text driver's behavior, uh, this type of things. I think I already talked about that. Uh, let me talk about taxi driver strategy. Um, taxi driver strategy, basically it's a schedule. Um, their pure strategy is a schedule. Basically it says, uh, one example is what period to work and then what, what period to, to take a break. One example is I get up at five, work for three hours, and take for a break for one hour, and start to work again for another four hours, and take a break for another two hours, something like that. It's a schedule. So then they have many schedules, and this will exponentially increase with the number of periods over a day. Let's say one day, we uh, divide this day to 24 periods. In each period represents one hour. Then we, the schedule, which means which hour I will work, which hour I will take a break. Now, something like this. And the, uh, each driver's strategy, basically it's a mixed strategy, it's a distribution over the pure strategies, a different type of schedules. Um, so each schedule has a probability. So it's a probability distribution. And, and given the probability distribution x, xi, let's say we have m pure strategy for each driver. And we know the distribution. Then based on that, we can compute the number of tank drivers in each period, right? Because here, um, in our current model, we do not differentiate different tank drivers. We assume they all follow the same strategy. Um, that is the assumption. We have not considered the difference between different tank drivers. Um, so, you know, given each tank driver strategy, we can compute in each period how many tank drivers they're working on the road. Then based on that, which is P, then based on that, we can compute you know, the congestion, everything like that. Um, and obviously, for each tank driver, they want to maximize, compute the optimal distribution to maximize their utility function, which is their revenue. Okay. So, uh, as we know, as I just mentioned, tank drivers they have some scheduling constraints. Um, for instance, they cannot work continuous for an extremely long time. Uh, every day, they might work for at most eighteen hours, um, and also they cannot work for okay continuous work for more than maybe six hours or something. They have to take a break. And also, they, every day, they cannot work for more than 18 hours, something. They have those type of constraints. So those constraints are used to generate the feasible schedules of the taxi drivers. Um, so as I just mentioned, this is basically by naval optimization problem. Um, we optimize system efficiency, and taxi drivers optimize their utility. Um, so from the government perspective, we, our design variable is F, which is a fair price in each, each time period. And with that, each tank driver, they compute the equilibrium, their optimum price, given the strategy of other tank drivers and the fair price decided by the government. Do you need to Ah, uh, yes. So that simplifies the setting a lot. So some difficulties Number one is, as we just mentioned, tank driver strategy space exponentially increase with the number of periods. Uh, that's something we have to deal with. So we come up some different solution algorithms. So um, I'm going to briefly talk about three algorithms. Number one is Antrim schedule method, um, then which is published in HKF 13, and then we have um, number two and number three, which is published in MS this year. Um, so, so number one and number two, which only consider constraints, the two constraints I just mentioned. But in fact, 
uh, in some other settings, we might have many other constraints, uh, especially in cities in China. For instance, in lots of cities, the government sets up constraints such as if you work until 4 p.m., you have to continuous work until 7 or 8. You cannot switch. You have to continuous work. Because the government observes that not taxi drivers, they do not want to take a passengers um, you know, during rush hour. Uh, so if you work at 3 or 4, you have to continuous work, uh, something like that. They have those type of constraints. Um, for instance, market regulation cannot switch in peak time, uh, those type of things. So um, then we also come up with a new approach which is, um, can handle this arbitrary constraints. So um, for those first two constraints, we can come up polynomial time algorithm. And for this one, it's extremely hard. And we come up some algorithm which is not polynomial, but still very efficient when we try different settings. Okay. So because of the time, I guess I will not talk about the details, but give you a very high level taste of those techniques we use to solve this problem. Um, so the first approach, which is called interim schedule, um, basically each interim schedule, the definition of interim schedule, which is a continuous working section in a schedule. Um, so for this is a pure strategy. We have three interim schedules. Um, the number one, which works from one, two, three, four. Then the second one is uh, from five, six, from seven, eight, nine. So what we can see is uh, even there, the number of pure strategy like this will exponentially increase with uh, you know the number of periods. But the number of atom schedule, which is polynomial, uh, which is much smaller. So our key idea is instead of computing the distribution of those pure strategies, we compute the probability of those atom schedules, which is much easier to solve. And after we compute this, we can reason back to get the probability distribution of those pure strategies. So that's a key idea. And then we can prove if we can compute this optimal, uh, optimal probability of this atom schedule, we can get an exact um, pure strategy, uh, mixed strategy distribution, which is matches this, the probability distribution over the atom schedule. So that simplifies the problem. That's how it works. Um, so that's the first approach. The sec second approach is we just look at the, the, the constraint, the, the two constraints we, um, I just mentioned. And we come up a linear program. Um, so the key idea is, is uh, motivated by the two representation of, um, of a polytope. So for each polytope, there are two representations. One is based on extreme points. The other is based on half space. So uh, if we look at this problem, if each schedule can be treated as an extreme point. Now, so our, the second approach we use is we just convert the representation to, to um, the vertex representation to half space representation. And so for the a vertex representation, each vertex is a pure strategy, a schedule. Uh, it's something like this. But the number of, then we have another thing is half space representation of the, the is constraint. The number of half, the number of constraint is much, much smaller. That's a key idea for solving this, uh, for solving this problem. So half space representation is much, much more compact um, as compared with the vertex representation. So uh, I will ignore the details, but basically we come up this. Um, so basically here it says a convex polytope has many vertex but much fewer facets. For instance, an n-dimensional cube we have two two to a power of n vertices but only two n facets. So um, we just convert the uh, vertex 
which vertex, each vertex is uh, scheduled into the um, uh, half space. Is there some structure there that you can exactly, exactly, because because it? because of these two constraints. Uh, we so far we just consider two constraints. One number one is they cannot work for two now per day. Number two is they cannot continuous work for two now. So there's some special structure. We have proofs in the paper, in our paper, see a optimal as a representation of the half space corresponds to the exact representation based on the vertex. Okay. So maybe the number of constraints in this case would like simplify your problem? Or um, the, make this or much complicated. We cannot apply this anymore. Two constraints that it's like? uh, that's true. Obviously, those two are quite simple. Uh, so only number one is you cannot work for more than 18 hours per day. Number two is you cannot continuous work for more, more than four hours. So those are two very reasonable, but extremely intuitive constraints. So, but if you consider other optional constraints, we cannot do that. I guess that's why our Antrim schedule approach can work. After you compute the probability over Antrim schedule, you can go back to find the corresponding mixed strategy because these two constraints are simpler. Uh, but if you consider optional constraint, you cannot do that. You might not find a mixed strategy which can give you the probability of the Antrim schedule. Okay. So I um, guess that's the idea. The half space representation is quite simple. It's something like this. And, and we can now, we can solve this problem extremely efficient. Um, so another approach is, uh, another problem is now we start to consider some other optical constraints as some constraint I just mentioned. In that case, we can show that the existing two methods cannot work anymore. Um, so then the problem now we need to go back to the the exact schedule, the vertex representation of the strategy space, uh, which is too too big, and we cannot solve that. So then we come up with this uh, approach called Flora A. Um, so the the idea is somehow very similar to column generation in solving large scale, um, you know, linear program problem or optimization program. So we start with a small pure strategy set. Um, a small number of vertex uh, in this vertex representation of the strata space. Uh, we try to construct, um, by doing that, we have a small problem. And we solve that problem. And then we find a new strategy which can be used to in improve the solution. If we can find that, we add it to this uh, small problem, this representation. And we continue to do that until we cannot find a new vertex new pure strategy which can, which can improve the solution of this problem. If we cannot find another one, then it stops when we find out the optimal solution. It's very similar, and the basic idea is similar to column generation, uh, but uh, we have to tune it to, to uh, make it work for our problem. So that's a high level uh, idea uh, we use to solve this problem. So we did some experiments based on the Garmin data. Um, for instance, in, for Beijing, uh, we can easily find the data about the traffic everything from the Garmin reports. Um, basically, we have a long time results, and we also see the, uh, how our price can improve the system efficiency. Um, and we did find there could be 15% increase in terms of uh, system efficiency. And we also find that uh, if we have other constraints, uh, random constraints, arbitrary constraints, we have to turn to the new algorithm because if we just use a solution based on the, the two simple constraints, the solution might, be, might not be good. So I'm not going to talk about details, but with some high level idea. So it helps. So any questions so far? Or you can ask me questions in the end. So now I'm going to move to the second problem. Yes. Markets, um, the travel time is also included into the uh, fare. Like, in uh, addition yeah. to how much, yeah. how, how, what kind of distance you go, there's also the time yeah. component. Yeah. 
Um, I guess you are not considering. We are not considering that. So this is very interesting because, um, so in China they do consider that, but that has very small weight, because what? Because tank drivers they may play with that if you, that part is too big. Uh, you know, they, they, they want to earn more revenue, so the government is very sensitive. There is that component, but it's very small. I see. So the, the adverse effect would be the driver selecting a route that yeah. is going to take a long time for the customers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Can you do the same thing? Because, but like, take a route that's going to be far away so that you can do the same thing with respect to the distance? Uh, that's true. I, I think. Distance, you know, basically the driver has the experience. They, they might know which route is more vulnerable. So I guess normally they will not do that. Otherwise, the customers could complain. Um, so I guess that's not the biggest issue, uh, except yours. You do not know that city. You know, you're strangers. Then they might do something. Yes? One possibility is that uh, there's one route that is the shortest, but it's very, but yeah, very congested. So yeah, yeah. Just that one and wait. Uh, true. True. So it, it there. This is very really interesting problem, and there has been many studies. So basically, we just ignored that part because there there are many um, lots of interesting things could happen. Um, okay. Sorry. Is there any possibility that the constraints like we should consider like occur independently, like uh, C1, just only C1 occurs or only C2 occurs? I guess C1 and C2 are quite reasonable. Um, I guess they both happen in every city, every scenario. But there may be some other constraints, depending on the government policy, this type of recognition, market recognition, those type of things. So I'm going to move to the second problem. This is also some real world problem. Um, I found this problem when I moved to Singapore. Singapore is trying to introduce more uh, electric vehicles. Because we all know it has many benefits. Um, they signed a contract with some companies and they will introduce electric vehicles, perhaps starting from uh, buses. And then um, um, you know taxis. Then the governments need to build charging stations. Um, now, so if they charge at home, sorry, there's some problems with the slides. They, it will take a much longer time. But if they charge in charging station, it's very really fast. So now it says 0.5 hours, but actually they just need five minutes based on some new technology. Uh, it's super efficient. So definitely there is a need to build charging stations in the city. Now the question is where to build that. So that's a problem we're trying to look at. Um, so the problem is somehow uh, similar to the, uh, the taxi efficiency problem. In the sense, still in the, in a very high level, it's still a bi-level optimization problem. And higher level, the government decide where to put charging stations. After that, drivers, car drivers, decide where to charge. They're still playing a game. It's more, it's somehow similar to a congestion game somehow, because they're still self-interested. They make their best, best choice in consideration of other things. Um, I guess the question is uh, how, to, how to handle this. I guess we hope that this approach can be used to help the Singapore government to decide where to build charging stations. Um, so still motivated by a real world problem. Um, so there's something special we want to consider in this problem. Singapore, it's a very small country, very small city. From the west to the east, if there's no traffic, 30 minutes, you can drive through the country, very small. Uh, but traffic congestion is a big concern to the government. Um, the government tried everything to alleviate the congestion. And we're thinking whether we can do something smart. By smartly allocating the charging station, we can somehow 
improve the traffic congestion. Uh, because people will, if they charge, that will have some effect on the traffic congestion. One simple example is if you put all the charging stations at downtown, so everyone needs to charge in downtown. Downtown is already extremely crowded or highly congested. If they drive to downtown to charge, then things will get worse. So that's something in our mind. Perhaps we can consider that as something we want to optimize in allocating the charging station. Um, so this is a map of Singapore. So the modeling approach we use here, we divided the Singapore city to, uh, so that's a problem. We want to assign a number of bill of chargers to end zones such as minimize the use cost of all the EVs. I will talk about the use, usage cost later. So, uh, and I will talk about the problem modeling and uh, our, our solution. So the modeling part, the basic idea is like this. We divide the country into many zones. Each zone can be treated as a small area. In Singapore, they basically have 28 zones or something. And each zone, we know we have lots of data about how many cars there are, uh, people's traveling patterns, those type of things. So we can easily get data. Then we can do uh, experiments based on those data. So uh, we divide the country, the city, into many zones. And each zone, um, there, there are cars, EV cars. And there are N zones, and in total we have B chargers. And each zone we have some EVs and we have some chargers. And XI is something we want to optimize. Uh, we want to, that's our decision variable. That's our variable. And the charging cost of each EV basically depends on the travel time. If I charge, how much time, how much, what's the travel time? And that's one. And our thing is the congestion, the queuing time, and the charging station. Because if there's a charging station, there's so many cars we are waiting, then the queuing time is a cost. So um, each zone, the, congest the charging strategy of each zone is the probability of charging in different zones. For instance, for a, if I'm living in the zone two, so for this simple scenario, so my strategy would be charge and zone two with probability P22, charge station and zone three and with probability P23, and charge and zone one and with that probability. So that's our strategy. The strategy space of each EV in that zone. So um, then we can formulate this by a naval optimization problem. In, in higher level, the government is trying to optimize, um, to minimize the social cost. The social cost could be anything. So in our model, we consider the congestion or the cost of all the EV drivers uh, could be anything or any different combination with different weights, whatever. Um, that's something the government tried to optimize. And each EV is trying to minimize their charging cost. As I mentioned, includes the travel time, uh, perhaps the queuing time, could be something else. For instance, uh, how much the distance they need to travel, not just travel time, because that could be something different. Okay, so that's still quite similar to the, the model uh, for the taxi system efficient optimization problem. Um, now, still we need to solve this equilibrium in the bottom, in the, in the second level, in the lower level. Um, well, here we just consider um, they have a budget in terms of the total number of chargers they can put. But it could be anything. For instance, in this zone, we can only build at most five, or in our zone, we can build at most at least 10 or something. We can put into that into the optimization problem. Yes? It also depends on how many cars are Okay, um, that's that's a decision variable. I mean, you're talking about the data, how many how many EV cars in each zone. So for the experiments, uh, because we know how many cars in each zone, 
um, then perhaps we just assume 10% of cars will be EV cars. So we just use that model, make that assumption. Is there any way that you can, I mean, I'm just thinking about it, like uh, how the other um, gasoline stations are there. Like, is there any algorithm for those things? Or that you can for, for what? For, for the gasoline, like the gas stations? Uh, how, how they're built? I do not know. I guess that's uh, because those stations were built now, long time ago. I guess um, obviously it's not decided by some algorithm. Perhaps just they have observation. We need more gas station, and this this area they just build one. So uh, how about just put uh, uh, like two charging stations or Are optimized over time for the car but they are distribution. concerned about the cluttering as well, right? So, well, um, that a good one. You're talking about the constraint, those type of things. Uh, I guess, for instance, perhaps for some gas station, they have a limited space. They just could not end more EV charging station in that space. And also, obviously, we have to think about the cooling time, uh, all those type of things. But yeah, I mean, if you're talking about our constraints, that definitely is something we can consider. If you're talking about the, for instance, construction cost, if we put in gas station, perhaps that's cheaper. Uh, whatever, we can add those type of things into this uh, this framework. Okay. So that's pretty much our model. Um, I guess the problem of this, uh, the difficulty is still how to solve this problem. I guess the most difficult part is the bottom level, um, we're trying to compute the equilibrium. So we consider Nash equilibrium. Basically, nobody wants to deviate to another charging strategy, probability distribution. Now, how to specify that constraint? Um, let me just explain it very high level. Nash equilibrium says, given your charging distribution, probability distribution, if my equilibrium distribution is x, I have no incentive to choose another x prime. So which means in the constraint, we have to say for any x prime, x is better. But the problem here is x prime is a distribution. The space is infinite. We just cannot list infinite number constraint into this problem. That's the difficulty of solving this problem. What we did in a very high level, we start to look at the the structure of those constraints. And we convert this infinite number of constraints into a set of finite number of constraints, which are equivalent. Then we're able to solve this problem. That's uh, at a very high level. Um, so I guess the, the problem is we have uh, you know, an infinite number of constraints. So, so infinite is just because of the space? Yeah, so Nash Kramer says, uh, so each of us, is a driver. You have a strategy, which basically says the probability of charging at this charging station, another charging station. Nash Kramer says, for each player, given your strategy, I have no incentive to choose another one. So if my Kramer strategy is x, it has to, I have to have a constraint. For any x prime, x is better. But x prime is a continuous, because it's a probability distribution. They're just infinite number of constraints. That's not that we cannot specify those type of things into this, you know, whatever by Neville, you know, linear or non-convex. So, is not a X prime is. We have to we have to represent the Nash equilibrium as constraints. But if we want to represent that, they're just infinite number of constraints. Yeah, because we're assuming they're playing Nash equilibrium. Because the the um, EV drivers they're playing a game. They're because they're they're competing. Because too many drivers come to the same charging station, the queue time could be huge. This is the this is the agency's problem, right? Yeah. We're trying to help with the government to decide where to put charging station. But the government problem is very complicated. What you're saying, we have queuing constraints and uh, other things that makes the problem very non-linear. Um, that's true. That's true. 
Well, there are basically in transportation science or those type of science, there are many equations. Uh, some are nonlinear, definitely. Some are convex. And I guess in our model, uh, we use some the most widely used, you know, representation of or those type of things from the transportation science literature to represent, um, you know, how different factors will affect each other. Okay. So, uh, so the key idea we use is simple division. Um, so, as I just mentioned, Nash Kramer says, given x, I have no incentive to change to x prime. But x prime could be quite different from x in terms of I change the probability for each zone. So here, we just consider simple deviation. We only change the charging state in two zones. So that's, so um, for, for instance, uh, let's say my equilibrium strategy, so I guess the f simple deviation is here. So uh, delta P2, which is my deviation. I might change my probability in each zone. For instance, there are P21, there are P22, there are P23. Um, that is a deviation, normal deviation. But now we just consider simple deviation. Basically, we just consider changing charging strategy and two zones. For instance, here, uh, the second line, we just change the strategy in zone one and zone two. The, the third one, we just change one and three. So um, what we show is that, given the problem, we prove that if for a driver, if the driver has no incentive to make a simple deviation, the driver has no incentive to make a um, normal deviation, then we can convert the original problem where we specify Nash equilibrium as normal deviation to simple deviation, which those two problems are equivalent. We f further analyze the simple deviation and convert, still we have an num infinite number of constraints, but in the end we can analyze this, this problem and we can turn this into a finite number of constraints. But I will ignore the details, you can find our finding in the paper. So now in the end we come up we can um, zipper in this problem as an optimization program, and in the end, we can come up with solution algorithms to solve this problem. Because of the time, I will explore the details. And we uh, different approaches. This is on time comparison, and we compare this with many benchmark approaches. Um, and it turns out our approach is better in terms of optimizing the system efficiency, the government efficiency, the government objectives, the social cost. Um, so that's pretty much the two problems and very high level. Uh, there are definitely many future work to do. For instance, for the taxi system efficient optimization, um, in our current model, we do not consider, we assume all taxi drivers that are the same. Obviously, we can consider heterogeneous taxis and taxi drivers. And um, so we assume each human being, everyone is fully rational. That, that is not realistic. Um, so I know MSR has lots of people doing urban computing, you know, those type of things. Um, you should have lots of data about how human beings will make this in such scenarios. Then you could put human behavior model into this model. And obviously we have not considered the impact of app-based service like Uber and many other things. Um, and also we just consider a whole city, um, perhaps the, the city, you know, there are lots of spatial viruses. Um, can be considered as well. So um, for EV charging station, uh, still human behavior. Another thing we are working on now is assuming that, like Singapore, the charging station have been decided. Now whether we can do something to optimize the traffic by changing the price and each charging station. Um, that's something we are considering now, which is still quite realistic because traffic is just a huge problem for Singapore the biggest problem for Singapore, because citizens are complaining. Uh, the government is trying everything they could to help with uh, you know, the, the congestion, whatever. Another thing I want to point out is the second problem, you know, th this is called um, a placement problem. 
um, the Singapore government is also interested in some other things. They want to know, they just announced some ground call about similar problems. They want to know where to build schools, where to build hospitals, so that they can help with you know, the traffic, that people do not need to you know, uh, take a long way to go to school or uh, go to the hospital. Um, obviously, we, for, to solve those problems, we need to build um, a preference model, how people will make, make a decision based on different factors, and then try to optimize our problem. Um, so I guess uh, I feel um, there has been a lot of work on big data, try to just make, give people suggestions just purely based on the historical data. But our approach is more from model-based approach. We just assume people are fully strategic. Uh, they will always compute equilibrium. So I guess there should be something in the middle based on some human modeling, behavior modeling, and with some, um, you know, the game theoretical model. I think that could be more journalistic because his theory good data only represents the past, but people, we always play games. We always, when we make decisions, we always consider what other people might do. So I believe there should be something in the middle. Try to combine both to make the knife, you know, everyone's knife much better. Um, I think there should be lots of um, work can be done in this, uh, I would say emerging error. Um, thank you. So, um, if any questions, please let me know. Thank you. I have a question. So, um, I think as human aspect in all of these systems are super important um, for implementing them in the real world. So, for both systems, how does the solution of the um, optimization look like? Is it something that you can describe to a taxi driver or to a person who wants to use a charging station easily? Like, okay, this is how you're going to be paid, or it is dynamic, changing every day. What would be a good way to kind of express the outcome of the system to the um, users? Um, okay, so what do you mean by outcome? For example, the taxi system efficiency optimization system optimizes these parameters of the fare yeah, yeah. function, right? Um, so now you need to express this to the taxi drivers so that the taxi drivers can make a decision about working at rush hour or not. How does that interface do you think is going to look like? The taxi drivers? You mean tell taxi drivers? Yeah, because you need to okay. tell them what so, the so, new fare system looks like, right? Yeah, like, yeah. This is how you are going to be yeah, paid yeah. from now on. Is it, is it something easy to express to them? Okay. Or is there a challenge in kind of making them understand how they are going to be paid from now on? Okay. Uh, that's a perfect question. Um, so for our uh, model, we basically just try to compute the optimum price for the rush hour. I think that's something which can be easily understood by drivers and citizens. Um, Obviously, we can consider more complicated cases. For instance, we come a price for each period, and, but that's more complicated. So for transportation science, there has been lots of interesting human behavior study, human sub experiments. As you remember, in some cities in Europe, then people come up with this idea. Um, the government decides no price. Every time we take a taxi, you just negotiate with the taxi driver. Uh, that's extremely flexible. What's happening is nobody wants to take a taxi. Why? Because human beings, we want some predictability. If we feel that's not something predictable, we will switch to other things. We will take, take buses or uh, subways, this type of things. But that's something very interesting. So um, obviously, if you want, I guess uh, human behavior modeling is needed here. Uh, you, if you want to make extremely complicated pricing scheme, which is not journalistic, it may not work in practice. I guess that's something we needed. Um, I guess we just consider maybe just rush our price and normal our price. That's it. I guess that's easier and let people know this you know, once, then I guess that's something can be easily adopted by the government and accepted by uh, citizens. 
Vancouver. Uh, it actually estimates how much fare you have to pay actually. So, okay. so it's like beforehand you will be like prepared like okay this is the amount I'm gonna pay kind of thing. So you can decide whether you want to take the taxi or not. So yeah, there has been some interesting human experience to study you know how people's uh, behavior. Human beings are extremely complicated. Yes. Have you shown the outcome of your optimization to Chinese taxi drivers and asked them like, would you work? Well, I every time I when I was taking taxi, I always talk to them. They feel this is good or switch. Um, they would like they will uh, think about to work during rush hour. Um, so if the price is higher, um, I guess this will definitely work. But I did not talk to the government because later I just went to Singapore. Uh, if I stay in Beijing, I, will, I think I would definitely talk to the government. Um, perhaps they could consider something like this. But I guess my, the, um, the key take of a message here is uh, for any problem, optimization problem, whatever, involve human beings, um, some game theoretical thinking is needed because we, we are kind of somehow strategic in making decisions. Thank you.